Hello, I'm Deborah McLeod, Senior Director at Gagosian Beverly Hills, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you into the gallery today virtually, and I hope in person very soon, to see Nancy Rubin's phenomenal exhibition, Fluid Space, that is up through August 6th. Today we will have a panel discussion between Nancy and Eric Shiner. Eric is one of the great professionals in the art world, having worn many hats, best known as a leading scholar on Andy Warhol. Nancy Rubens is a master sculptor, making powerful and ambitious sculpture and drawings in her Topanga Canyon studio and ranch. She is a transformer of objects over the decades of her practice, turning huge water heaters, airplane parts, boats of all kinds into the building blocks for her ambitious sculpture. Without further ado, I hope you will enjoy the conversation between Nancy and Eric. Deb, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and it is such an honor for me to be sitting here today with Nancy Rubens, one of the great contemporary artists of our age. And Nancy, first off, congratulations on this wonderful exhibition <laughs> called Fluid Space. And in thinking about that title, I cannot help but think about universes beyond ours of black holes, of solar systems. And yet I also think about the need that we as humans have to be flexible, to be fluid, to help us to navigate our world and certainly the age within which we live and all of its many complications. So I wanted to start there and think about for you, what is the relationship between stasis and action? Because I, I feel that your work has a kinetic quality, even though it's static. I always feel as though it could burst into movement at any moment. And I've always wondered how that concept of the frozen versus that which is moving plays into your thinking about your work. Um, it's, it, it seems to me, ever since I've been making stuff, since I was a really little kid, um, I loved working with material that was transient. Um, uh, when I was really little and we'd be at, at take a vacation to a beach, uh, taking the sand and making these intricate little drippy sand castles and working on them meticulously for hours and hours and building them up and then part of them would come crashing down and then rebuilding on top of that for hours and hours and then that would come crashing down again and rebuilding on top of that. And I could develop these beautiful attenuations in the sand and the little drippy things and the development on top of all these crashed previous sand growths uh, really was interesting to me. And then after a few years, I evolved into getting uh, all my crayons and candles and going in the backyard and melting them into these great drippy crayon candle drip drip things. And a similar thing would happen. I'd build them and build them and build them and then something would break under its own weight and crash down and I could continue building them. Time goes by, I go to college and I was really loved working with clay. Clay was my kind of favorite material. Um, I loved it because it was so gushy and forgiving and you could do anything with it and you couldn't make a mistake. There were no mistakes you could make with clay and it left a full range for a really wonderful experimentation for me. So I can make these things, sometimes take pictures of them and then uh, it, when I was done, just put it back into the slip bucket and it became mushy clay again. So. That was a real pleasure for me, working on the potter's wheel. You know, I had a friend who was a really great potter and I could work next to her. I was a terrible potter, but I loved <laughs> seeing the clay kind of grow and do this really wobbly thing and then come crashing down. It was, for me, it was kind of a physics class, you know, it was an engineering course. It was a way to see what worked, where it stood, what pushed it over the edge and how it came down. So I, I really loved working that way for a long time. Time progressive progresses. I go to school, I go to art school, I go to graduate school, I get out of graduate school, and I started collecting massive quantities of objects and using them in my work. 
Um, and as time goes by, I start really learning about these objects and their history and what happens to them. And, and at a certain point, I started using airplane parts when I was here in LA. And I made friends with this gentleman, Mr. Huffman, who uh, had mountains of these airplane parts. And he would at that time sell them to me for scrap value, which was 10 cents a pound. And he had 17 acres of truly giant mountains of them. And then, you know, I would go out and visit him for years, and then one year, his mountain had shrunk. Mr. Huffman, what happened to the man? Well, the price of aluminum went up, and he cranked up the big smelters and started producing X tonnage of ingots and shipping it out. Okay, great. And he would show me pictures of himself in National Geographic magazine. Right after World War II, he designed a mobile smelter and went out throughout the Southwest and melted down the war fleet of airplanes. And uh, he was very proud of this picture. Okay. So I used airplane parts for a long, long time. And then at a certain point in the last, you know, bunch of years, a guy who works, who brings me, finds metal materials and brings them to me, started bringing to me these weird little spring animals that were being ripped out of shopping centers in parks um, that children would jump and spring on. And they're probably deemed unsafe now. And they were very strange to me. I didn't, I wasn't really sure what to do with them. They were so figurative. I, first didn't want to touch them, but I was really attracted to them, so he kept bringing them more and more to me. And then I start working with them, and it suddenly dawns on me one day, ah, these are Mr. Huffman's airplane parts. They were, they, they were the first ones were being made in the very late 40s, early 50s, and you could see as the price of aluminum went up, the walls of them would get thinner and thinner. So the soldiers came back from the war, the planes got melted, the baby boom happened, and these things went to that. And I caught them right at their cusp when they were getting ready to be melted down to make this stuff. So I, I really started thinking about uh, the materials and their history in the universe and their history, the earth, becoming a glob of stuff and it being wished around in the earth as it was being formed and then it was mined here. And then it's much cheaper to reuse and recycle this stuff than to mine it. So in a very short period of time, I've seen a, a certain, a, 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 a transform, transformation of this material several times. So. I really started thinking about that. And I started thinking about that in terms of these pieces. These pieces came from a large cast uh, kitsch uh, uh, animal forms that are kind of cartoony and goofy looking that uh, I'm not really sure why people, why they're produced. I think people put them in their yards or maybe the giant hogs are used for a barbecue sign, I'm not really sure what they're made for. Uh, however, I know that the materials that have gone into them have been used and reused and reused again. So from my point of view, I'm catching this thing in a, in a moment of time. You know, just a, in a moment of time. and. What that does, how that helps me, is when I start learning about the stuff they're starting to learn about from uh, the sky, astronomers are learning now with the kind of uh, telescopes they have and the information they're starting to gather. It's really hard for me to conceive of the kind of space and time, and I think it is for all of us, that these folks are talking about. It's hard for me to really even understand geologic time, that the dinosaurs were at a certain time, even though we have their bones in the earth to show us that they were here. So for me, dealing with those small transitions of that material in a very short period of time helps me wrap my head around that issue 
a very deep time in a funny way. It's very short, what I can wrap my head around, but that sample of it helps me understand better that other kind of time. Well, it makes sense. Or it, it's an attempt, at least. Exactly. It helps us to find our place in the universe, no. our little tiny blip in a <laughs> massive <laughs> timeline that none of us could ever truly yes. conceive of. And yeah. I love that from an early age, you were equal parts alchemist, sculptor, mm -hmm. and engineer, and really thinking about how things work, how things come together, how things fall apart. And you also hinted that, you know, from an early age in college, you started to accumulate objects. You started to call from popular culture objects which had an imparted a certain meaning um, on you and for you. So I would like to think about that specifically in that one could easily say that you are an appropriation artist in ways. And of course, we could draw parallels with artists like Andy Warhol or Marcel Duchamp, Andy known for his use and depiction of soup cans and Coca-Cola bottles, and Duchamp with his ready-mades. But one could also think about the accumulation of objects through the lens of Kusama Yayoi, for example, or any number of artists who are really bringing things together, like Louise Nevelson, for example. But your work is totally different than all four of those artists, certainly. But I'd like to think about what role appropriation plays and how you come to choose and find these objects, which really are reflective of the culture that we mm -hmm. live in. And certainly kitsch lawn ornaments is a major trend all across this United States of America and beyond. Mm -hmm. I I first started collecting massive quantities of things when I first got out of graduate school. And um, at that time I had a, a, two jobs. I was waitressing at the Starlight Roof at the Sir Francis Drake Hotel 48 hours a week, six days a week. And I taught at the Art Institute at night, two nights a week. It was a, for, that was six hours a week. So I didn't have a lot of time. Sure. But on the weekends I'd go to like Salvation Army and Goodwill. Mm -hmm. And they had these color console TVs there and you could get them for 25 cents, 50 cents. And I thought, whoa, even if they don't work, you're getting something for that 25 cents. The wood, the bulbs, the glass, the stuff. They're weird and ugly, but you're getting something. So I collected a lot of them, like almost 300. And my idea was to build a piece on the roof. My landlord got wind of it. No, you're not going to. So I built a, a work inside my studio that didn't use all of those televisions. But I, I was very unhappy. I wasn't satisfied with the work. It was like, a, it felt like a punk Louise Nevelson. It really, the TVs never really transcended the TVs. It never really went anywhere for me. It, it kind of, I, I knew that something was, wasn't working for me, for me. So. Then I saw an earthquake and I started using this very thin concrete to make these very flexible walls. Mm. And I love that. I love that I could make, get this concrete, have this fluid gesture in space. And they were very minimal walls and there were no objects in them. Then I got a teaching job in Richmond, Virginia. And all through Richmond is all this brickwork from, you know, it's brickwork. And in the brickwork, there are big globs of these kind of melted globs of brick. And you go, what is that? That's left over from the Civil War, and that's where the buildings melted, and that's a piece of glob of melted building. Oh, that's pretty. So I would go to the Salvation Army again, and I started finding these small electric appliances, mounds of them. I could fill my car for $3 with, you know, stainless steel toasters, chrome toasters, little hair dryers, little electric, and just innumerable things. And the good thing about these things was they were small and I could suspend them in a wall of concrete. I figured I'd build two rows a day like rock work and I could get these things going at cocky angles and I could develop this long wall of concrete with these things embedded in it. And it became this odd jewel-like wall 
that the things lost their electric appliance-ness and they became something else. Now, at that time, I was really also conscious of all those folks who were considered American primitives, like Simon Rodia and Grandma Prisby, who did all these bottle buildings and, you know, a milk of magnesia, blue milk of magnesia building that just glowed. Mm -hmm. And these people did this often as a, a, an issue of economy, wanting to make something very beautiful to satisfy themselves and to uh, make their own world more gorgeous but it was also an issue of economy, which was my issue also. I thought, wow, you know, I really am, I found caviar here. I got all this beautiful stuff and it's almost free. I couldn't produce it for that amount of money if I had to. Right. And it was loaded with a certain content that kind of fascinated me that could disappear once I started using it. As time went by, I started learning how to use a support a rebar, a structural steel inside the concrete of these appliance pieces. And so I could develop these kind of weird undulating mass, you know, forms that would globby and undulating and, and, and precarious. So that gave me a lot of pleasure. When I moved to LA, I started seeing the mobile homes and they were wonderful because they were like swollen appliances and I just loved that. Yep. Structurally, they were terrible. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and working with those with hot water heaters, that was the first time I really started thinking about with the hot water heaters, the elements themselves as structural forms. Mm -hmm. And I, that's when I first started working with Colin, my friend, my assistant who works with me, who lives in Paris. And we really started figuring out using the wire in this kind of uh, an odd form of tensegrity with compression and tension so that we could candle either out these hot water heaters in ways that we never expected we could do, which was really a delight. So for me, the objects kept evolving, the things that became interesting to me. After using those trailers, I started finding these airplane parts, and it took years to make friends with Mr. Huffman. People were very secretive as to who I could buy them from and what. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing about the airplane parts for me has been that they have this remarkable structural integrity. You can use them as their own structures and build out these wonderful cantilevers. So I started, that's when I first started using those tables and building out from the tables with the cantilevers of these airplane parts, using them structurally. After the airplane parts, the boats came into it and they were just these elegant forms and I realized, oh, that makes sense. It's Grumman, Grumman made the airplanes. They made a lot of these boats. It was again that switch from people who are making these, air, these war things and then they want to make these happy, joyful things. It was kind of an interesting way of seeing how things were made and why they were made and who made them. And, you know, it, it, was, just an, it was just an interesting thing for me to glom on to the objects with. It didn't tell me what I was going to make, but it made the objects very interesting for me to play with, you know. Now, these pieces came from a development of seeing, I started making pieces that would go together in parts, and I would see the crane move those parts in the air, and they were rather, relatively small, and I thought, oh man, those things are gorgeous, but how do I bring these large objects into that scale? So that's when I decided to start cutting up these parts. And I started realizing, well, you know, Mr. Huffman cut those airplane parts up. It's really not that much different from that, just that we chose to cut them up. And we found these, I found these beautiful lines and shapes that I could pull out of those kitsch objects and, and translate them into my own forms, transform them into my own forms. I do have to ask you at this point, did you ever know that Andy Warhol's brother was in the scrap metal business? 
I think maybe I heard that years ago, years and years ago. I think maybe Kasman told me that, <laughs> but I haven't really thought about it since. <laughs> Just an aside, but Andy's brother Paul was in the scrap metal business as are many of his sons still to this day. Wow. And I always just loved that idea that while one brother was scavenging yeah. imagery from yeah. popular culture and yeah, turning it into yeah. fine art, his brother was scavenging real yes, objects and turning that into cash. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. <laughs> in, it's poetic in so many ways. Now, in addition to these monumental and absolutely elegant sculptures in the exhibition, you're also featuring many new works on paper. And when I look at these large scale sculptural drawings, they are just so incredibly complex. And at first you think that it is sheet metal that has been twisted and turned, that you have spent inordinate amounts of time shaping metal. But upon closer inspection, you realize it's paper and countless thousands upon thousands of marks. And you're using graphite in this ceaseless motion to create a surface that is both metallic and reflective of light. It's incredible how light plays off of these works. And I just want to ask you, when you make these, are you viewing it as an action-based process, or is it a meditative process Both. for you? I make the drawings over a period of time and I draw on the floor. And what I love about drawing is that it's just a lousy piece of paper and it's pencils. But yet, it seems like when I'm making the drawings, I'm able to develop this really weird, liquid, deep space. So that is a real pleasure for me to see the space develop from this kind of flat piece of paper that this weird deep space. And, you know, during COVID, it was wonderful to go down to the studio, turn on the radio, spend a couple hours drawing, listen to the birds chirp and go back home and have done my work for the day. Uh, once the paper is as dense as I need it to be and of the scale I need it to be, it goes on the wall really quick. You know, it, it maybe take 10, 15 minutes to get it on the wall, if that long. Mm -hmm. Rarely do I have to noodle with them very much. So yes, it's a meditative gesture, but it's also an action gesture, and then it's done, you know? And they do also have this incredible sense of movement to them. And when you look at the sculptures and the drawings in juxtaposition with one another, there is a soaring um, back section with a tail going off in this direction, just as there's a tail of sorts coming off of the drawing. So they sing to one another hmm. in so many wonderful ways. And, you know, thinking about the past year and COVID and the reality that we are, you know, navigating still, where an unseen menace came to attack us from nature. I wanted to very specifically ask you, in relationship to these works specifically, which are comprised of broken animal parts, where is that relationship between nature and culture in your thinking as you make these works? Because certainly culture is man-made, nature comes to us, we inhabit it, we deal with it, and certainly sometimes nature um, rebels, if you will, and attacks us. So I just wanted to throw those two concepts out to you and ask how those notions play into these works specifically. Nature is so much bigger than us, you know, and um, I think when I start when I began these works, it was before COVID. Um, but certainly there was enough disrupting our time yes. before COVID. Um, when I started taking those whole uh, buffaloes and elk and moose cartoon animals and cutting them up and making these sculptures, um, I was trying to figure out a way to make uh, a complex and elegant forms 
um, and build a sculpture that I would want to keep going back and looking. I, I would maintain my interest, keep my eye interested. Okay. When I started cutting those animals and before I started cutting them, I started thinking about, I was trying to figure out how to bring the scale down and how to get these intricate parts. Uh, and I started thinking about when I was a kid and my folks, we'd go visit my grandmother in New York and my folks took a, the family to the uh, Statue of Liberty. And there you see you approach the Statue of Liberty and the boats, the ferry, and you see it from afar and this great green lady and she's holding her torch. And my dad insisted that we weren't gonna take the elevator, we were gonna go and walk the stairs and go and see inside it. Fine. So here's this grand lady and the big plinth, the pedestal, and then you go inside it. And it was startling. I, you know, you see these lumps of the inside of the, of, the, of the bronze and black tar where the seams have been dripping and to keep, and all these uh, structural struts throughout it, and then the spiral staircase, and you can go up in her arm. I thought, whoa, this is something. Statue of Liberty, she's, you know, she's complex. This is a com complex, and you know, it's not this cartoon of what you think is going on out there, there's others. So that made me think about these things, that here we have these kitschy cartoon, big dopey animals, but then when you start cutting them up, it starts revealing these other things on the inside that are quite beautiful, and it has to do with the timing and the making of them. Mm -hmm. The point of the, you see the point of the bronze and the little drippy things from the point of the bronze and the welds that the uh, men made who welded the thing together and the grinds that they went back into with their hand to make the welds disappear. And then you'd see mistakes they made and the, the weld didn't quite match. The, so they'd have to put these little shims inside and you see little chunks of metals shoved in between the seams and so, I, part of me kept thinking, wow, this is much more beautiful and much more interesting, and it exposes a certain truth that you don't see on this other side. The other side is a cartoon, it's, you know, it's a make believe but this other, this inside, you really are seeing a certain truth that was very interesting to me. On that point, in Japan, there is a concept called kintsugi which is literally golden joinery. And it is very specific to Asia. And in Japan specifically, the idea is that if one happens to break or crack a centuries old vase or plate or tea bowl, one puts it back together again using gold to fuse the parts back together into a semblance of a whole. And yet, it of course is very different than its original iteration. And yet that joinery is celebrated as an aesthetic force in and of itself. So people actually appreciate the artistry with which broken objects are put back together again. And I can't help but think that in your own way, you were using these high tension wires to bring some semblance of order back to the chaos of these broken bodies and you were thus refiguring them in a way. And for you, the kintsugi is not actual gold, but it is metallic wire. And I, I sense there is something there. And I just wanna ask yeah. you about that notion of repair. Yeah, it was interesting that you, you brought that into the conversation because it's not anything I would have thought of, but now that you talk about this, I've been thinking about a little bit. And that repair, the kintsugi, is a, real, is a gesture of empathy and respect yes. for that object, Absolutely. empathy. Yep. And it's a funny thing, it's an object, but you're imbuing empathy as a human to this precious thing mm -hmm. and imbuing it and making sure it's even more beautiful 
than it was before you broke it. Exactly. So in doing that, it brings us able to talk about that. You know, it, it's a kind. It, you know, it's a kind. We make work as a as a language. It's a conversation. So you're trying to bring up these things, at least to talk about in your mind. So the gesture of repairing those cracks. I think about Sal Scarpita's work right after World War II, sure. making those bandaged canvases, you know, wrapping them and, you know, it was a repair, it was a way of, of comforting the stretcher, of comforting that thing and helping it heal. So, yeah, it's, it, I, I, I like thinking about that. It's very and that beautiful. And that is exactly what it is. It is a, an empathetic gesture, of course, in Japan, um, which has both Buddhist and Shinto religious history. The idea of objects having a soul mm -hmm. is a very real thing. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that one would want to protect mm -hmm. that soulfulness mm -hmm. of an object by piecing it back together again, just as you do. And you create absolutely thought provoking and complex structures that are empathetic to the original objects and their original materiality, and yet allow us as the viewer to take our own histories and to really apply them to the experience of looking at these really masterful works, to be certain. I also just wanted to talk about how you actually build these works, the actual mm. studio process, in that you're working with very heavy objects in their initial form. Mm -hmm. When they're cut down, they're more navigable, mm -hmm. certainly. But what is your studio process like? Are you using cranes and large equipment, or is it a smaller scale operation? For these pieces, you don't need cranes except to pick them up when we put them on the roof. That's good. Uh, but I have, there's two fellas that I work with, uh, and during COVID, we organized so that everybody was working in separate locations. One, I would draw on these, uh, creature, on these cast animals, and one fellow would cut them up and with a grinder and make the edges nice so that you don't cut your hands on them. And um, I found these tables through a, a catalog a welding catalog and we started this was the first piece and we started shoving the you know parts through the table and t wiring them on and figured let's see how much we can load it on mm. and not have the table collapse mm. and be really happy with the sculpture and have it fit within a certain fit into a shipping container mm. so uh, so we built it and we, you know, I was really happy with the sculpture. I loved all the angles. And then we tried to move it a couple inches and one leg just completely <laughs> folded under itself. Okay, we pushed it as far as it needed to go. So what do we do now? Well, we simply just had my welder make the exact same tables, a little bit thicker steel, stronger. Same thing with the stools. The guy who made the stools just made them thicker than you would a normal stool, a little more strong and we map them out and have been going from there. So basically, one piece just leads to another. You know, you put in the first two or three pieces and they kind of inform me where the next parts are going.